Necropolitics, written by Achille Mbembe, translated by Libby Maintjes, and read by Sen Naomi Kirsch Schultz. This is part two. If the relations between life and death, the politics of cruelty, and the symbolics of profanity are blurred in the plantation system, it is notably in the colony and under the apartheid regime that there comes into being a peculiar terror formation I will now turn to. The most original feature of this terror formation is its concatenation of biopower, the state of exception, and the state of siege. Crucial to this concatenation is once again race. In fact, in most instances, the selection of races, the prohibition of mixed marriages, forced sterilization, even the extermination of vanquished peoples, are to find their first testing ground in the colonial world. Here we see the first syntheses between massacre and bureaucracy, that incarnation of Western rationality. Arendt develops the thesis that there is a link between national socialism and traditional imperialism. According to her, the colonial conquest revealed a potential for violence previously unknown. What one witnesses in World War II is the extension to the quote-unquote civilized peoples of Europe of the methods previously reserved for the quote-unquote savages. That the technologies which ended up producing Nazism should have originated in the plantation or in the colony or that, on the contrary, Foucault's thesis, Nazism and Stalinism, did no more than amplify a series of mechanisms that already existed in Western European social and political formations. Subjugation of the body, health regulations, social Darwinism, eugenics, medico-legal theories on heredity, degeneration, and race, is, in the end, irrelevant. A fact remains, though, in modern philosophical thought and European political practice and imaginary, the colony represents the site where sovereignty consists fundamentally in the exercise of a power outside the law, ab legibus solutus, and where quote-unquote peace is more likely to take on the face of a war without end. Indeed, such a view corresponds to Carl Schmitt's definition of sovereignty at the beginning of the 20th century, namely, the power to decide on the state of exception. To properly assess the efficacy of the colony as a formation of terror, we need to take a detour into the European imaginary itself as it relates to the critical issue of the domestication of war and the creation of a European juridical order. Jus publicum europeum. At the basis of this order were two key principles. The first postulated the juridical equality of all states. This equality was notably applied to the right to wage war, the taking of life. The right to war meant two things. On the one hand, to kill or to conclude peace was recognized as one of the preeminent functions of any state. It went hand in hand with the recognition of the fact that no state could make claims to rule outside of its borders. But conversely, the state could recognize no authority above it within its own borders. On the other hand, the state, for its part, undertook to civilize the ways of killing and to attribute rational objectives to the very act of killing. The second principle related to the territorialization of the sovereign state, that is, to the determination of its frontiers within the context of a newly imposed global order. In this context, the jus publicum rapidly assumed the form of a distinction between, on the one hand, those parts of the globe available for colonial appropriation, and on the other, Europe itself where the jus publicum was to hold sway. This distinction, as we will see, is crucial in terms of assessing the efficacy of the colony as a terror formation. Under jus publicum, 
A legitimate war is, to a large extent, a war conducted by one state against another, or, more precisely, a war between quote-unquote civilized states. The centrality of the state in the calculus of war derives from the fact that the state is the model of political unity, a principle of rational organization, the embodiment of the idea of the universal and a moral sign. In the same context, colonies are similar to the frontiers. They are inhabited by the quote-unquote savages. The colonies are not organized in a state form and have not created a human world. Their armies do not form a distinct entity, and their wars are not wars between regular armies. They do not imply the mobilization of sovereign subjects, citizens, who respect each other as enemies. They do not establish a distinction between combatants and non-combatants, or again between an quote-unquote enemy and a quote-unquote criminal. It is thus impossible to conclude peace with them. In sum, colonies are zones in which war and disorder, internal and external figures of the political, stand side by side or alternate with each other. As such, the colonies are the location par excellence where the controls and guarantees of judicial order can be suspended, the zone where the violence of the state of exception is deemed to operate in the service of quote-unquote civilization. That colonies might be ruled over in absolute lawlessness stems from the racial denial of any common bond between the conqueror and the native. In the eyes of the conqueror, savage life is just another form of animal life, a horrifying experience, something alien beyond imagination or comprehension. In fact, according to Arendt, what makes the savages different from other human beings is less the color of their skin than the fear that they behave like a part of nature, that they treat nature as their undisputed master. Nature thus remains, in all its majesty, an overwhelming reality, compared to which they appear to be phantoms, unreal and ghost-like. The savages are, as it were, quote-unquote, natural human beings who lack the specifically human character, the specifically human reality, so that when European men massacred them, they somehow were not aware they had committed murder. For all the above reasons, the sovereign right to kill is not subject to any rule in the colonies. In the colonies, the sovereign might kill at any time or in any matter. Colonial warfare is not subject to legal and institutional rules, not a legally codified activity. Instead, Colonial terror constantly intertwines with colonially generated fantasies of wilderness and death and fictions to create the effect of the real. Peace is not necessarily the natural outcome of a colonial war. In fact, the distinction between war and peace does not avail. Colonial wars are conceived of as the expression of an absolute hostility that sets the conqueror against an absolute enemy. All manifestations of war and hostility that had been marginalized by a European legal imaginary find a place to re-emerge in the colonies. Here, the fiction of a distinction between quote-unquote the ends of war and the quote-unquote means of war collapses. So does the fiction that war functions as a rule-governed contest, as opposed to pure slaughter, without risk or instrumental justification. It becomes futile, therefore, to attempt to resolve one of the intractable paradoxes of war, well captured by Alexandre Kojève in his reinterpretation of Hegel's Phenomenology of the Spirit. Its simultaneous idealism and apparent inhumanity.
Necropower and the Late Modern Colonial Occupation It might be thought that the ideas developed above relate to a distant past. In the past, indeed, imperial wars did have the objective of destroying local powers, installing troops, and instituting new models of military control over civil populations. A group of local auxiliaries could assist in the management of conquered territories annexed to the empire. Within the empire, the vanquished populations were given a status that enshrined their despoilment. In these configurations, violence constituted the original form of the right, and exception provided the structure of sovereignty. Each stage of imperialism also involved certain key technologies, the gunboat, quinine, steamship lines, submarine telegraph cables, and colonial railroads. Colonial occupation itself was a matter of seizing, delimiting, and asserting control over a physical, geographical area, of writing on the ground a new set of social and spatial relations. The writing of new spatial relations, territorialization, was ultimately tantamount to the production of boundaries and hierarchies, zones and enclaves, the subversion of existing property arrangements, the classification of people according to different categories, resource extraction, and finally, the manufacturing of a large reservoir of cultural imaginaries. These imaginaries gave meaning to the enactment of differential rights to differing categories of people for different purposes within the same space. In brief, the exercise of sovereignty. Space was therefore the raw material of sovereignty and the violence it carried with it. Sovereignty meant occupation and occupation meant relegating the colonized into a third zone between subjecthood and objecthood. Such was the case of the apartheid regime in South Africa. Here, the township was the structural form, and the homelands became the reserves, the rural bases, whereby the flow of migrant labor could be regulated and African urbanization held in check. As Belinda Bozzoli has shown, the township in particular was a place where, quote, severe oppression and poverty were experienced on a racial and class basis, unquote. A socio-political, cultural, and economic formation, the township was a peculiar spatial institution scientifically planned for the purposes of control. The functioning of the homelands and townships entailed severe restrictions on production for the market by blacks in white areas, the terminating of land ownership by blacks except in reserved areas, the illegalization of black residents on white farms except as servants in the employ of whites, the control of urban influx, and later, the denial of citizenship to Africans. Franz Fanon describes the spatialization of colonial occupation in vivid terms. For him, colonial occupation entails first and foremost a division of space into compartments. It involves the setting of boundaries and internal frontiers epitomized by barracks and police stations. It is regulated by the language of pure force, immediate presence, and frequent and direct action, and it is premised on the principle of reciprocal exclusivity. But more important, it is the very way in which necropower operates. Quote, the town belonging to the colonized people is a place of ill fame peopled by men of evil repute. They are born there. It matters little where or how. They die there. It matters not where or how. It is a world without spaciousness. Men live there on top of each other. The native town is a hungry town, starved of bread, of meat, of shoes, of coal, of light. The native town is a crouching village, a town on its knees.
unquote. In this case, sovereignty means the capacity to define who matters and who does not, who is disposable and who is not. Late modern colonial occupation differs in many ways from early modern occupation, particularly in its combining of the disciplinary, the biopolitical, and the necropolitical. The most accomplished form of necropower is the contemporary colonial occupation of Palestine. Here, the colonial state derives its fundamental claim of sovereignty and legitimacy from the authority of its own particular narrative of history and identity. This narrative is itself underpinned by the idea that the state has a divine right to exist. The narrative competes with another for the same sacred space. Because the two narratives are incompatible and the two populations are inextricably intertwined, any demarcation of the territory on the basis of pure identity is quasi-impossible. Violence and sovereignty in this case claim a divine foundation. Peoplehood itself is forged by the worship of one deity, and national identity is imagined as an identity against the other, other deities. History, geography, cartography, and archaeology are supposed to back these claims, thereby closely binding identity and topography. As a consequence, colonial violence and occupation are profoundly underwritten by the sacred terror of truth and exclusivity, mass expulsions, resettlement of quote-unquote stateless people in refugee camps, settlement of new colonies, Lying beneath the terror of the sacred is the constant excavation of missing bones, the permanent remembrance of a torn body, hewn in a thousand pieces, and never self-same. The limits, or better, the impossibility of representing for oneself an original crime, an unspeakable death, the terror of the Holocaust. To return to Fanon's spatial reading of colonial occupation, the late modern colonial occupation in Gaza and the West Bank presents three major characteristics in relation to the working of the specific terror formation I have called necropower. First is the dynamics of territorial fragmentation, the sealing off and expansion of settlements. The objective of this process is twofold, to render any movement impossible and to implement separation along the model of the apartheid state. The occupied territories are therefore divided into a web of intricate internal borders and various isolated cells. According to A.L. Weisman, by departing from a planar division of a territory and embracing a principle of creation, of three-dimensional boundaries across sovereign bulks, this dispersal and segmentation clearly redefines the relationship between sovereignty and space. For Wiseman, these actions constitute the politics of verticality. The resultant form of sovereignty might be called vertical sovereignty. Under a regime of vertical sovereignty, colonial occupation operates through schemes of over- and underpasses, a separation of the airspace from the ground. The ground itself is divided between its crust and the subterrane. Colonial occupation is also dictated by the very nature of the terrain and its topographical variations, hilltops and valleys, mountains and bodies of water, Thus, high ground offers strategic assets not found in the valleys, effectiveness of sight, self-protection, panoptic fortification that generates gazes to many different ends. Says Wiseman, quote, Settlements could be seen as urban optical devices for surveillance and the exercise of power, unquote. 
under conditions of late modern colonial occupation, surveillance is both inward and outward oriented, the eye acting as weapon and vice versa. Instead of the conclusive division between two nations across a boundary line, the organization of the West Bank's particular terrain has created multiple separations, provisional boundaries which relate to each other through surveillance and control, unquote, according to Wiseman. Under these circumstances, colonial occupation is not only akin to control, surveillance, and separation, it is also tantamount to seclusion. It is a splintering occupation along the lines of the splintering urbanism characteristic of late modernity, suburban enclaves, or gated communities. From an infrastructural point of view, a splintering form of colonial occupation is characterized by a network of fast bypass roads, bridges, and tunnels that weave over and under one another in an attempt at maintaining the Fanonian, quote, principle of reciprocal exclusivity, unquote. According to Weissman, the bypass roads attempt to separate Israeli traffic networks from Palestinian ones, preferably without allowing them to ever cross. They therefore emphasize the overlapping of two separate geographies that inhabit the same landscape. At points where the networks do cross, a makeshift separation is created. Most often, small dust roads are dug out to allow Palestinians to cross under the fast, wide highways on which Israeli vans and military vehicles rush between settlements. Under conditions of vertical sovereignty and splintering colonial occupation, communities are separated across a y-axis. This leads to a proliferation of the sites of violence. The battlegrounds are not located solely at the surface of the earth. The underground as well as the airspace are transformed into conflict zones. There is no continuity between the ground and the sky. Even the boundaries in airspace are divided between lower and upper layers. Everywhere, the symbolics of the top, who is on top, is reiterated. Occupation of the skies therefore acquires a critical importance since most of the policing is done from the air. Various other technologies are mobilized to this effect. Sensors aboard unmanned air vehicles, UAVs, aerial reconnaissance jets, early warning Hawkeye planes, assault helicopters, an Earth observation satellite, techniques of, quote, hollow grammatization, unquote. Killing becomes precisely targeted. Such precision is combined with the tactics of medieval siege warfare adapted to the networked sprawl of urban refugee camps. An orchestrated and systematic sabotage of the enemy's societal and urban infrastructure network complements the appropriation of land, water, and airspace resources. Critical to these techniques of disabling the enemy is bulldozing, demolishing houses and cities, uprooting olive trees, riddling water tanks with bullets, bombing and jamming electronic communications, digging up roads, destroying electricity transformers, tearing up airport runways, disabling television and radio transmitters, smashing computers, ransacking cultural and politico-bureaucratic symbols of the proto-Palestinian state, looting medical equipment. In other words, infrastructural warfare. While the Apache helicopter gunship is used to police the air and to kill from overhead, the armored bulldozer, the Caterpillar D-9, is used on the ground as a weapon of war and intimidation. In contrast to early modern colonial occupation, these two weapons establish the superiority of high-tech tools of late modern terror. As the Palestinian case illustrates, Late modern colonial occupation is a concatenation of multiple powers, disciplinary, biopolitical, and necropolitical. 
the combination of the three allocates to the colonial power an absolute domination over the inhabitants of the occupied territory. The state of siege is itself a military institution. It allows a modality of killing that does not distinguish between the external and the internal enemy. Entire populations are the target of the sovereign. The besieged villages and towns are sealed off and cut off from the world. Daily life is militarized. Freedom is given to local military commanders to use their discretion as to when and whom to shoot. Movement between the territorial cells requires formal permits. Local civilian institutions are systematically destroyed. The besieged population is deprived of their means of income. Invisible killing is added to outright executions. War Machines and Heteronomy After having examined the workings of necropower under the conditions of late modern colonial occupation, I would like to turn now to contemporary wars. Contemporary wars belong to a new moment and can hardly be understood through earlier theories of contractual violence or typologies of just and unjust wars or even Karl von Clausewitz's instrumentalism. According to Sigmund Baumann, wars of the globalization era do not include the conquest, acquisition, and takeover of a territory among their objectives. Ideally, they are hit-and-run affairs. The growing gap between high-tech and low-tech means of war has never been as evident as in the Gulf War and the Kosovo Campaign. In both cases, the doctrine of overwhelming or decisive force was implemented to its full effect thanks to a military technological revolution that has multiplied the capacity for destruction in unprecedented ways. Air war, as it relates to altitude, ordnance, visibility, and intelligence, is here a case in point. During the Gulf War, the combined use of smart bombs and bombs coated with depleted uranium, high-tech standoff weapons, electronic sensors, laser-guided missiles, cluster and asphyxiation bombs, stealth capabilities, unmanned aerial vehicles, and cyber intelligence quickly crippled the enemy's capabilities. In Kosovo, the quote-unquote degrading of Serbian capabilities took the form of an infrastructural war that targeted and destroyed bridges, railroads, highways, communications networks, oil storage depots, heating plants, power stations, and water treatment facilities. As can be surmised, the execution of such a military strategy, especially when combined with the imposition of sanctions, results in shutting down the enemy's life support system. The enduring damage to civilian life is particularly telling. For example, the destruction of the Pansevo Petro chemical complex in the outskirts of Belgrade during the Kosovo campaign, quote, left the vicinity so toxic with vinyl chloride, ammonia, mercury, naphtha, and dioxin that pregnant women were directed to seek abortions, and all local women were advised to avoid pregnancy for two years. Wars of the globalization era therefore aim to force the enemy into submission regardless of the immediate consequences, side effects, and quote-unquote collateral damage of the military actions. In this sense, contemporary wars are more reminiscent of the warfare strategy of the nomads than of the sedentary nations or the conquer and annex territorial wars of modernity. In Bauman's words, quote, they rest their superiority over the settled population on the speed of their own movement, their own ability to descend from nowhere without notice, and vanish again without warning, their ability to travel light and not to bother with the kind of belongings which confine the mobility and the maneuvering potential of the sedentary people." Unquote. 
This has been Necropolitics, written by Ashil Mbembe, translated by Libby Maintjes, and read by Sen Naomi Kirst Schultz, part two.